Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, today our presenter is Dr. Alan Crandall, who really needs no introduction. Um, the topic is going to be from bench to practice. So. Uh, good. Well, good morning, everyone. I, actually, what I uh, you'll see why I call it from bench to practice, um, which is really uh, our work that we do here um, with um, uh, the people that probably teach me the most, and that's Liliana and Nick in the laboratory, and uh, how, we, how we use data and questions that they have uh, that we try to answer and then try hopefully put it into some type of clinical practice. And I also wanted to touch on, you know, one of the things that we, we tend to do is, or like to do, is to be on the forefront, see what's going on, uh, and change our techniques as uh, more information becomes available. Nothing of this should be, mo most of this is not a conflict, but I think we should t see it. Most of these will be uh, outcome videos, but of course I do with AMO and, and the other videos as well. And for the glaucoma stuff, I'm on, uh, you'll see something of that, that that's in included. So uh, what's new? What do we do this last two years that, uh, that's different from what I do, did a few years ago? And why, why, might, why might we do it, and why might it be BS? Uh, we'll see. Uh, and I want every, anybody that has a question, you know, this is the point of this lecture is to maybe bring up some topics, uh, get some points of views about one of these. And I'm actually going to start with the bottom one, because uh, I'm doing this now, and I've been doing it for two years. And my, the re my reasoning behind it was based on OMIC data two years ago. Uh, and what they found two years ago was that 38% of, of uh, endophthalmitis was uh, MRSA, which uh, is kind of a scary, and this is not, this is not hospital-based MRSA, this is community-based MRSA, which means in actual fact that almost none of the antibiotics that we're using really covers it very well. And based on that, Doug Koch did a bunch of laboratory studies, and out of that, he came out with the uh, with the concept that he should uh, be using intracameral vancomycin at the end of every case, where he looked at it in rabbits and all sorts of stuff, uh, and looked at toxicity, worked with Henry Adelhauser and the, and the ASCRS group to look at potential toxicities, such as retinal or corneal, and in the dose that we're using, there's really not much. Uh, one thing that, he f that he's doing a little bit differently this year, uh, anybody that has glaucoma, I haven't had this problem, but he did see a number of patients that had pressure spikes using the vancomycin, and so in those patients, he uses uh, Bigamox right out of the bottle. So you know, the, and Bigamox doesn't have a great um, coverage for MRSA, but it covers it pretty well. Um, the, so, and a lot of people uh, throw vanco in, or any antibiotic in their, in their uh, uh, bottle, infusion bottle, but that's really been shown to, one, not reach high levels, and two, isn't around very long time. The, the intracameral injection, uh, some people have been doing it for years. Jim Gills, for example, puts in a whole pharmacopoeia at the end of a case. I think he puts nine different drugs in. He's been doing that for a long time, but uh, has no data to support it, no, no research. But certainly, the, I think this is, a, this is a concept that we should be looking at. Fortunately, anophthalmitis doesn't occur very often. So, as I mentioned, we've been I've been doing it here for about two years. Um, uh, it took us a while to get through the through the, um, the pharmacy committee here, but they they finally agreed to do it. So, it is available. And if you want to use Vigamox, you know you can just do it right out of the bottle. Vigamox is not um, is not does not have a preservative, and that's the issue with intracameral. So I, I think it's something to consider. As I say, MRSA is really climbing on the, on the scale, and it's nice to have it at the end of the case. Uh, I was hoping Nick would be here, because I think he did some work, but Randy, you might have some comments on, on that. And I, like, uh, the point is I want everybody that, that uh, has a stake in this to, to either argue with me or, uh, or, or whatever. So Randy.
Really? Any any reason? Yeah. Yeah, t that's where uh, that's of course where uh, that's where uh, that's where the OMAC data came from during uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Doug Cope was looking at. That in Southern California apparently has a pretty high. Yeah, the you showed, but I know there's a lot of people that just put an irrigated system and that makes no sense. It's no sense at all. You look at bullets at the end of the day. Yeah. You want to get high concentration. If you want to thing down to that about it, I think it might be very, very slow to kill it. Right. And that's what, so that's what we've been doing, and, uh, and if you if you want to use the Vigamox, that's it's I, I, I don't know if FDA a lot uh, it's I think well all these are off label anyway so it, it doesn't make any difference but it's, FDA is very gallant yeah because it's a, of the different levels right the particulates and others that are allowed in a topical versus uh, something right but, uh, plenty of people have used it and yeah. No, that that was that that was the biggest issue that I had to deal with with uh, the pharmaceutical uh, committee here, the infectious disease guys. They went through the all the all the evidence-based literature, and th there's just no there's no way with a small dose, a single dose like this, that you ma you have any effect on it. You just kill what's in the eye. The number of bacteria that are sitting in the antenna chamber. And yeah. But we're not we're not even touching we're not in anywhere near that and that's that's it actually took a, almost six months for us to get the uh, pharmacy committee to allow us to do this uh, and um, but that's that's been there been a lot on the chat line lately with that with that issue whether and there's still tons of people that are putting banco and ciproxamine uh, and all that in the, into the into their bottle and it's essentially nothing uh, Nick. Right, that's the big issue. Yeah. So ours are made up by our pharmacy uh, uh, in, in the morning um, and in the afternoon each time. So it's just something to think about. Okay, yeah. Forty dollars per case. Yeah, we're not. It, it, the, that's the charge that pharmacy is given. It doesn't cost anywhere near that. You know, I mean, it's very, very. <laughs> it's a very cheap molecule. Uh, yeah, I guess that's but I mean, that's really just my question. Yeah. If you're spending that much, you're potentially going to spend that much more on it. Mm -hmm. um, I would think if you have to take the five mega marks and still already know that you need it for the top of the drop factor, that you can squeeze that by it without it really. Now, uh, now let me ask you: How many of your patients use that correctly? Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
pretty low. It's pretty low. But they have to buy it anyway. Uh, you'd be surprised in studies that certainly we probably have a better population than, than most, but uh, some of the studies done show that uh, at least 50% don't even use it after day one. And, and you know, they forget it, they, lo they lose it, they don't use it. We don't need it most of the time. And uh, so it's just a, it's a question of, uh, some, some of this is, you know, certainly to avoid litigious issues for a very low incidence, but so that's why I bring it up. The issue is, there's cost issue, there's a, some people now are not given topical antibiotics, they're just using intracameral stuff and they're not doing it. And uh, we, there's a couple, that, uh, I think Barbara was at the meeting uh, in, um, well, and Randy, we, you and I did one with one of those studies where we, where we had the, the steroids. Now they have, the, they have a capsule that you, you can put in at the end of the case and you get two weeks worth of s uh, released antibiotic. That's in phase one studies now, which means we'll see it in about eight years. But the reason I'm sweet when it's tetraoxy is because it's cheap. Yeah, cheap. And actually, if you, if, let's say you improve the addition rate from one in 3,000 to one in 5,000, right. then your cost per uh, eliminator is still well below what you would need to do it for a million or million and a half. I mean, it is, it is that, you know, it is that worthwhile. It, it, is, it is not an easy question. Yeah, it's not. Um, uh, Doug did compare those two, and, and Banco was better than in the, in the, but, but in the Mercer case. Nobody's going to say, say Correct. And then, of course, we all know the tough cases that we encounter, why we, why we need some of these new tools. And, of course, here it's uh, PXE, PXE, PXE. Just a quick reminder, uh, we're share a little bit. We, we've done some Miyake views looking at uh, the use of caps or tension rings, so I wanted to bring that up. We have Miyake studies looking at the use of the AMED or the caps or tension segment in, in broken capsules uh, and, and why, you can, why you sometimes can s need it for stabilizing those types of cases, and then some modified CONIs. I want to bring up a couple of the new things that are involved in, in CTRs so that everybody's aware of them. Uh, as you know, we use CTSs intraoperatively to, to support, and I, I do believe I have a case for that. But then there are, everybody may be aware of these, but we had both sets available. They're really critically that in some of these cases, the MST hooks are the uh, is are the two on the left? I don't have a pointer. Maybe I do. One on the l on this is the MST, so it's designed to fit in the capsule, and and the difference between these and the iris hooks. Sometimes I use iris hooks when I'm doing the capsule rexus because it can do support, but it really they're not they're, they're they have a rough edge compared to these things, and they can actually tear capsules. They give you more of a point fixation. So this is the McCool hook. Uh, which has a little knob on it, which is really uh, machined nicely. The uh, uh, Gucci Hawagawa, I can't pronounce it correctly, is the, it's probably a better design, but w it's very difficult to get. You have to go, you have to send your money to, uh, to uh, Japan before you get, they won't even send it to you, you have to have a personal account with them, they're kind of strange. So I've been using mostly the MSTs, I've been very happy with those. Now, uh, this is, this is a video that should have won the Academy Awards at ASCRS, but it didn't. Uh, Liliana did it. So uh, every, this is the hurricane technique. So for 20 years, we used to teach that you'd strip to the center when you do INA, except when? Pseudo exfoliation. So the question is, if you're, all, if you're doing it for all, all the, uh, for the tough cases, shouldn't you really be doing it for all your cases? And I think the answer to that is yes. So that, that, you'll see who this is. This is, this is not me. Obviously, I don't use the metal things. I don't think they're good because they don't form to the wound. So you don't get as good a flow. So we're going to call this the hurricane technique uh, for INA. And I now have uh, 
uh, a lot of people that are doing that. What, why are we thinking about doing that? So this is some work that Liliana did with the guys from uh, Brazil. And what, what I want you to look at the zonules up here. So you have more stress on the zonules when you strip centrally. And you'll see when we do it tangentially how much difference it, it makes. Now, if you, you can even really see it here. Since this is sort of a, a tangential strip on this side, there's less zonular stress. So anytime you have pseudo-exfoliation, which is what, for all of us, a third of our cases or a quarter of our cases, we should not be doing any uh, stripping to the center. We should be stripping tangentially. And you can really see that, how, how much difference there is here in this uh, beautiful view of this that, uh, again, Liliana did with the, and I'll show you the, the, uh, the folks. And this, I've been doing this for about two years, but this is, this is the first time it's been done in, in bench work that really shows the, uh, the, the stripping, what it does centrally. So now I certainly try as much as I can to not do uh, central stripping. And the other thing is, it is incredibly more efficient technique. You can usually do it in one motion all the way around. Cut, cut down my flows to less than probably five, uh, it's about 15 seconds to do most of the INAs now and about, uh, we've been measuring some of the, some of the amounts that we use and it's, uh, it really is much more uh, efficient way of doing it. So, and you can see that it's much kinder to the, to the, uh, to the system and we've, we've always taught that. You do it on the tough cases, why don't you do it on all your regular cases? Um, and we'll, we'll see in about eight years whether or not we get less of a, um, of a, of a uh, uh, late subluxation. So this is radial. Again, you can just see it's, it's, this is a technique that, we've, that I actually taught for 20 years and stopped about two years ago because it really, when you look at it in the laboratory, it doesn't make as much sense. So sometimes you have to do a little bit if it's the last piece or whatever. We'll show some examples. And it doesn't matter what kind of INA. I, I, here's, this is a, a regular, you, you saw there was a metal one or a bent one. You can use it with a straight one. You can use it with any of the, of the systems you have. But you'll see here how much more efficient it is as you go around. You can do the whole thing basically in one maneuver. And Liliana, I do not understand why this one did not win. Beautiful. It's un... I know, but it should have won, it, it should have won at ASTRS, I know. It won the Rio, what, the Brazil Award, it won the International Medium Award, yeah. It's just, just a beautiful video, uh, really showing that. And again, so from seeing this, this, this further uh, uh, made me think more and more that you gotta be able, and I, I just put this, this is the, these are the guys that came up from Brazil uh, and, and did this. Now this is some older work that we, that we did, you can tell from the video, but it still is valid. One of the things is, is that it's, it's not a free pass when you put in a, you put in a CTR. You gotta know where the, it's best if you know where the, where the defect is and use the good zonules to, to, to do that. And here's a, you can see here that when you, it's, you wanna be as gentle as you can uh, putting the CTR in and wherever you can try to identify where the, where the defects are so you can use the good zonules to help you put them in. And then I think you may have seen this before, but I think this is one thing that certainly has changed how I, how I remove uh, uh, fake, or how I do remove uh, pseudo exfoliations where, the, where, the where there's any issues. I look at that, look at that right up there. So the most dangerous thing that you can do in many of these pseudo exfoliation cases is actually the rotational motion. It's, uh, and, it, and we've done this, we just, even with normalized. Now the reason we, do, we have a small uh, uh, rexus here, and uh, actually I think uh, this was Nick too in this case, as I recall, but, but we, do, we wanted it on purpose because frequently you deal with small pupils in pseudo exfoliation. So a lot of times you have a small rexus, and, uh, so, and so the rotational motion is even more dangerous. And so that's a good time to have pre-chopping, which uh, we showed in another video, the pre-chopping. In, in order of difficulty to on, the, on the zonules, femtosecond, uh, ultra chopper, pre-chopper, vertical chop, horizontal chop, and then uh, the worst is uh, uh, divide and conquer in terms of stress on the zonules, unless, unless it's done, uh, e each one in their most elegant fashion. That's the, that's the order that we found. 
And so once you, and you see on the stretching motion here, even on this uh, pseudo exfoliation one, you really don't stress too much on the zonules. And then this, of course, is, is uh, the posterior view uh, showing that there's really no uh, motion posteriorly. Um, we, we're gonna, w as soon as we get our femto, we'll be able to do some of these with uh, the femto looking at it. But I think you'll find the same thing that, uh, that as far as we can tell, that should be in terms of putting it into a divide and conquer type of, or d divided nucleus type, that the femto sh segment should be, should be pretty, pretty calm, uh, pretty good on the posterior zonules. But again, really emphasize that when you tr rotate anything now, Make sure that you don't push down because that clamps the capsule around and, and that's where you'll strip zonules. And I think a lot of the times the, there's some iatrogenic reasons that we're doing these things because we're not rotating elegantly. Make sure you have a great uh, hydrodissection way. Um, and make sure that you rotate following the anatomy of the, of the bag because that's the, these are times when you can, you can strip it. So uh, th these, are, these are again points that have actually changed, and I'll show you how I've changed my PACO uh, in pseudo exfoliations. That some that rotate, you can still do, some that don't rotate, I do hemi sections now and bring them up because there's a lot of, a lot of issues. You could, of course, put a CTR in, but what, what, do you, what happens when you put a CTR in and there's still a big nucleus? Rotation is very difficult, and it probably increases your zonular, uh, de it destabilizes your zonules even a little bit more. I'm not sure what else I got in there. I think I show it. So the other thing that we talk about is, is uh, now I'm going to stop this for just a second. Let's go back to that. Uh, shoot, we'll get it. We'll get it. Okay. So one of the things that uh, one of the questions we have is early data, and the, the question is, is it is it so biased that we're not really getting anything out of it? And I, I'm not going. I'll let uh, both I'll let uh, Nick, editor of the journal, and Randy talk about it. But one of the things that is coming out, at least early in some of the femtosecond data, is that when you have a rexus that's perfect, in whatever form you want to call that, and you cover your, your IOL, which we always try to do, right, 100%, uh, that the effective lens position can be tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, you know, this is, some of this was is Bob Sioni's stuff, some of it's Slade's stuff. Of course, it's all right now driven by uh, the companies in terms of a reason for using the femto. I don't think that's going to be the case. Femto is going to be good for tough cases, I think, as well. Uh, Decentered de lenses, it's great to do a Rexus. White cataracts, it's great to do a Rexus uh, and that kind of thing. So one of the things, that, again, that I'm doing differently based on that is making sure that I, that I mark every cornea so that, when we for so that we can look at, so I can get as much data as I can available on uh, exact uh, coverage of, of our IOLs and see, we'll see in a year or two whether or not it, it, it changes the effective lens position or g at all in, in, in hand done states, and then we can compare it to femto once we get it. Randy, Nick, any comments on marking? It's interesting because when a pupil is dilated, it's a different, uh, di you know, high myopia, hyperopia. It's hard to sometimes get your rexus the exact size you want it. There's two things. There's a big difference. Yeah. Right. And, and right. the studies that have been done have shown either uh, difference in, in the proper bracket that they couldn't do a better juxtaposition. It's just small enough to take a couple of points and right. see if you can create a greater small number of these cells. Fortunately, that's been open to corporate data to begin with from the mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our dip is Germany, and using the femtosecond, and people with weak 
Yeah, I've done I've done both of those with the pair killer. It really does. It's it's unbelievable. And, that's and to be able to. Yeah. Really hard stuff. Yeah. And, and I have no doubt in my mind. Yeah, I think it's going to be a value for that. So again, one of the differences, say this year, for, or last two years from say four years ago, is to is to is to do that. The other thing I've changed too is is the is the Rexus. I don't lead it around as much. I I can usually do a Rexus now with uh, one or two, uh, uh, three three always, but usually one or two uh, pulls using the Chinese technique. Again, seems to be uh, more zonular friendly, and we'll be looking at that. And this, of course, is the use of. Uh, of the ultra chopper, uh, I think Mastel is now getting ready to make his for available for all the all the machines. Uh, 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 if anybody doesn't know how the original was made, Louis Escoff in in um, South America basically took a FACO tip, took it to his lab, put it in a vise, and scrunched it down, and then used that to cut with, because uh, he has cases like this all the time. And so the the advantage is you can really get a, a beautiful crack. And you still get those hard fibers posteriorly, so you, you want to make sure you rotate around. And then whenever you're doing these kind of cases, make sure you understand flow patterns, but that's uh, something for different. Alan, considering that you're using a lot of ultrasound with that inside distal elastic, which dramatically decreases the thickness, are you at 120 inverse associated with uh, using uh, Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes, of course. There's two things, let me, let me, let me go back to that. There's two things that that you have to be very careful about. Uh, one is uh, to, to make sure this is a 2-2 two -two wound, uh, and you want to make sure you get good flow because of that. The other thing is you can, it, it, it's, it's a cut, it's a jigsaw. It'll cut anything it comes. So personally, I have not had a wound burn, but I've had some wound haze if on long cases. Uh, and we did, we looked at the, at the energy up at the end of, uh, there's just no energy that gets up to the, endothelium is so it, even though the numbers look big you know you're doing everything in the back so I'm not worried there but you can cut the rexus well so traditional Bill Barlow here did a study which he did with the actual wound fences the way oh I know I know you yeah can, you can get some pretty good you can do it yeah yeah but I can screw up I can screw up with a regular FACO I don't have to have a I don't have to have a hand but I can I I, I mean I think the the again you have risk to benefit ratio the risk of uh, since I've popping a capsule or, or doing something with these very hard cases is significantly higher and, I, and we've had no incidents of, of that even in, even in I, we did a case last week where we had uh, three Malugans in a 100% dislocated uh, I, uh, cataract and was able to get it out and put a CTR in. It's interesting that people don't know about this. I know, I keep talking. Uh, well, you know why? Do they not uh, just? No, they, there's two re the, ma the main reasons why is that is they're really, they, they want to push uh, femtosecond technology. And, and not a lot of people know how to, the, 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 the reps don't know how to do it, so that some people order it after they see one of our videos, and then they'll get, then they'll get wound burn or they'll get other issues. So you can, but you can get a wound burn, as you know, with, with very little FACO energy because it's pretty damn hot. But I think, whoops, oh crud, let's get to the end here. Okay, so I still think that it's a valid thing. I use it probably, uh, in, in my case, is probably 10 times a week, something like that. And then you can see the crack going through. And then the other thing that we're, that I'm doing, uh, of course, we'll get past this here in a second, is, uh, and this is, this is gonna be interesting, this will be, see, we'll see later, is I'm, I'm trying to remove all the anterior lens epithelial cells. This is a variation of the Singer sweep, so it has, so you can actually go under. Uh, it's r really amazing at the end of the case how much, how many cells we leave here. We, you can't see it as well here, but in, uh, in the, with the Enduroscope or with the Leica or the new um, Zyscope, you, you can really see how much lens epithelial cells are there. And so now, with the with the uh, with the residents and 
and myself for about the last uh, six months. We're doing lens epithelial removal on all of those, uh, trying to receive, and we won't know for a few years, but it may reduce the phimosis. It may reduce PCO. We don't know, but we're looking at it. I, it and so these, these are all in things that are slightly different um, than, than what we're using. And I just want to show this for those that uh, sometimes when you're putting in a CTR, because the, the, the um, bag is so loose, it's hard to get the, thing, the CTR around. So what, what you can do is you can put a 10-0 uh, nylon through the anterior, uh, through the eyelet, and you can use that to, to pull it around so it stays within the bag, and then use a second instrument through your side port, uh, uh, either a Kublin hook or whatever, to do that uh, uh, for that. And I just want to do a couple quick things on on pseudoexfoliation, then we'll get, get rack, racked up uh, some questions. A lot of questions about use of capsular tension devices. Some guys use it in 100% of their pseudoexfoliation cases to theoretically uh, reduce um, uh, late uh, bag subluxation, but Nick, we've got them in the lab. There's CTRs sitting in the back of the eye. So again, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So I think that that's, uh, I, it, it, there again, you have to risk the benefit ratio and cost ratio. So, you know, a CTR is 140 bucks. Uh, you're going to add that to your case. If you're going to add that to every suit exfoliation case that we do here, that would be, it would be a third of the case. Yeah. So I use it when you need it. And when do you put it in? As late as you, as late as you can, but as early as you need it. That's uh, Ken Rosenthal's mantra, and it's, it's really true. If you put it in early, it's hard to get uh, cortex, it's hard to rotate. Uh, if you need it to stabilize or center the lens, do it. But if you can add it at the last little bit, it's a much better thing. Okay, so just quickly, how, wh how, what has what is the laboratory thing taught me to do now differently? Well, you can see here, this is, this is your routine pseudoexfoliation case, except it's nice because it has a big pupil. So I do, uh, do first thing I do, is I, it's a hard, fairly hard nucleus, so I do a little uh, uh, ultra chopper, and then I'm doing viscodissection to see if I can rotate the lens, because the lens doesn't rotate well. And you see here, it doesn't, it didn't rotate very well, and so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to hemisect it. Uh, sometimes I can rotate it about 15 degrees, and if you can get one piece out, it makes it a lot easier. I'll show you there. But you can see even, even with viscodissection, it isn't rotating very well. So the, so the, the thing is, don't force it. Uh, if it doesn't rotate well and you rehydro to say a good wave, you know you can see a wave, then you probably have loose onules. You, you had wrinkling of your capsule, you had a little uh, deepening of the chamber as you, as you go in. So, you, so the trick here is to, is to hemisect it, bring it up, use chop techniques above the plane of the, or at the plane of the iris, not up too high, because these are usually hard nuclei. And we know that the endothelial uh, surface in pseudorex is is probably not as good as a standard uh, endothelium, so they a lot of times have or can have edema following uh, anterior chamber phacos. That's why I don't flip these if I if I don't have to. But point being, don't don't rotate if it's if it's difficult. So that that was something that uh, the I learned uh, very dramatically. I think from the uh, from our our laboratory stuff. It really has changed the way I do do these surgeries. And again. We'll see if this makes a difference later on. It's, it sometimes is nice also if you have a little extra uh, cortex that you can't get to. These, these, these goes in. It's very nicely designed. It won't, unless you, unless you accidentally make a mistake, you're, you can free up cortex really very nicely. So then again, the just a couple of, the, of just the uh, hurricane method. So basically, uh, what, you, what you do is you just try to keep it uh, occluded as you go around, and don't strip to the center. And this is not sped up, so you can see that this, that's an average time. So it takes really reduced the amount of time that we do. Here, I'll just get through. This is one of the uh, new uh, or the ways I do. Make one large central thing, tear it around. This is, the, uh, if you watch any of the Chinese guys, they can actually do it in one, in two moves. And I average about three moves. but. Again, you just have to understand vector forces, and it's very easy to, to lead it around, and you don't get that cute little dimple at the end of your rexus 
by following it because you go outside of the uh, outside of it. So, so the uh, Rexus is certainly different. And then again, we'll do INA. We have a, a few of these. You can see the average is now is about 10 to 15 seconds of of INA time, and certainly less than you can do most, including Franco cases, with about 80 to 60, 80 to 100 cc's of fluid. So it really reduces the, the stress. But more importantly, thinking of the stuff that Liliana did, you're reducing the stress on, on the zonules. So I don't think we need to see 20 of these, but I, I have these for another case. Now, again, CTR, uh, the question about using a CTR in uh, serial exfoliation, again, you, could, you can see as, a, as this is going around, if you look in front of my tear, there's a wrinkle. That means you have loose zonules. And then there, was wrink there were wrinkles 360 degrees around. So this is a case you know you don't want to rotate unless it's so easy it almost does it by itself because that, that you're going to strip all those zonules. So even though this isn't a very hard nucleus, again, I'm going to do a hemi section and bring this up because I know if I try to rotate this even, any, even minimally, I'm going to have issues. Now here what I was after you crack it, sometimes you free it up enough. So I rotated to get those into two pieces or three pieces, uh, made it a lot easier to get it out, <coughs> and then making sure that we get the, the good uh, motion here. Let's just get to the CTR insertion. Also, when you think you have loose zonules, don't come out. You can, it's easy to pop a bag on the way out. Put your viscoelastic in, drop your bottle height, and then. Then you can go to zero at about 50, and, and, the, and the bag stays formed. So you don't get flow, you don't get issues. And I even do that when I'm done with the INA, because that's when things come up. It's pretty easy to strip more zonules, and it's pretty easy to, uh, to pop a posterior capsule. It's difficult to do with a silicone tip. Now, this is, a, this is the new Morcher uh, one. If you haven't used it, you should. It's a very nice way to do it, I, and I have a video showing what it is. But wa watch, watch the bag. So you see the decentration. It's a pretty loose bag. But it centers up nicely. So what, are you, what, what, I, what are you're looking for is you wait 10 or 15 seconds. If everything recenters, then you're, then you're probably good to go. If it doesn't, then add something that'll, such as a, um, you could add a Sioni, or you could do a, do a uh, I'd, I'd use an Ahmed segment. So this is the new. Yeah. And then insert it, and then, and then yeah. pull it till it comes around again. And then yeah. no pressure, point pressure, until it's finished, and the whole thing goes back. Or, or pull it with that 10-0. So this is the new, C the CTR material is different. That's why I like it. It's a, it's a softer material. It's more like the AMO material now. So it's, it's not, not as rigid, and it's easier to put in. It comes in this left and right gig. It's not left and right for your eyes. It's, it's which way it comes out of the thing. So. If you have superior zonules, you might want to use a, an L because it'll come out this direction. If you want to use, if you have total zonules, it doesn't make any difference. But it is a nice injection system, it's, and it does go I easily through 2-2, two -two, very easy to get. And again, I think the nice thing about it is the material is different, and it's a lot kinder on the up there. Now, this is, this is something brand new. Uh, Gary Congdon, uh, a friend of mine from Pittsburgh, is a great surgeon, came up with this idea. So um, what basically, it's a variation on the technique that, that Ike and I used uh, published a long time ago for st stabilizing these bags, but it's really, uh, I think, an elegant way to do it. And it really, this is one of my cases over here. You can see this is a classic pseudo-X with, uh, with the uh, single-piece lens, very pneumatic uh, capsule, uh, 360 degrees of, of, of uh, that's dropped down. So basically what he's doing is he's going two and a half millimeters behind, uh, which is similar to what we do, grabbing the, the, the uh, complex, if you will, and you can see there's a CTR in here, and he's going to go through underneath it. And the difference is we used to dock these, bring them out, and, and sort of send them back. This is a much, much, much easier way to do it. And we don't care about the cornea. It's just a... It's a window. We'll just poke it anywhere. Actually, we try to go from the side, the different sides you'll see over here. I'm trying to, trying to get it all up so it isn't dead center. But here's the trick. Let me stop mine for a second. The trick is now, 
now you've got this loop just like uh, think of a seeps or not. So rather than going back in, all he does, I don't like using this, I prefer to use a, an MVR blade, but he just uses a 0.8 um, uh, thing. And, and now we have, upstairs we have in my, in my set, if you want to use it, it's called the snare. It's designed to go in uh, for seeps or knots and for this, and all you do is pull the knot through just like a seeps or knot. So you only have to make one needle pass. It, 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 it takes a, uh, this down from an, probably an hour procedure to 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It's so much easier. To, and then you go to the other side and do, this, do the same thing on the other side. So you get the point, you go under, through the bag, through the cornea, go through your, through your MVR uh, stab using the snare, snare your, that, bring it back out, and, you're, and you've, got, you've, you've lassoed it. Uh, so I, it's really an, an elegant way to do it. We only have one snare right now. I'm ordering a bunch. I think we need three probably. Um, have you used it, Ravi, at all, the snare? No, it's brand new. It's we. Uh, yeah, there's only they've only made they only made two. One for Condon, one for me. But we have it here. We've had it here about a month. So anybody that's doing seeps or knots or IOL repositions, uh, ask them to use the, the MST set that I have because it's got the snare in it. And so what it does is it the snare comes out, grabs and, and it's it's fantastic and it does ADO vortex. And so these are just these are some. Uh, this is a a much more elegant way of, of doing an, an IOL reposition. And then, of course, just a quick uh, using the Gore-Tex technique, and I won't make you watch Rex's, I, even though obviously they, they don't need to be stained. Anytime you have a tough case, stain the capsules because it's a lot of times very difficult to see where these are. And that these, are, that's, these, are, uh, uh, these are McCool hooks that are in there once you get the bag evacuated. The reason why I wanted to show this is that the new, uh, there, if you look at the, the new Sioni is called a G1. It's, it's, it's much more flexible. It's much easier to put in than the, than the standard one. I'm trying to get them to, to get rid of those and just use the G1 because it's much, it's a much different material. It's much easier to put in. And even in these cases with really loose bags, it's, it's much easier to put. They only have it in a, in a, in a modified, a C1 modified. So there, there are no new materials not in the two loop. It's only in, in that. But I don't, I, I prefer to use this plus, a, plus an Ahmed segment for the really loose zonules. And, I don't, and, uh, and that's Gore-Tex uh, material. That's all I've been using certainly in the kids these days. It really uh, is so kind and it doesn't break down. It was, we'll see in... 10 years, but we certainly, we have some out at least 10 years with no breakage. I think uh, 96 was the first time we, we used it in, in, the, in these Marfan's kids. So with that, I think those are most of the new the things that I've been doing. Uh, uh, and the one quick one, even though this is, a, this is a pretty, looks like a pretty routine case, and you may wonder why I stained it. But you can see as, I, as you tear around that the, the, the rexus is there's there's uh, folds in front of the of the uh, of that showing that these th that these all these zonules are weak. So in this case, what we're, what I'm going to do, I'll just get to the chase here, and I'll use two uh, segment. One uh, covers about 220, and then the second one down here. And then at the end of the case, you can just fixate those to the to the uh, to the sclera. Sometimes I'll do that before I, or I'll have them at least positioned before we do that. So with that, I think we'll stop. Uh, ask any questions or comments. I think it's really interesting that, that the laboratory is so critical. And the Miyake views that we're looking at really is, as I say, it changes the way I, I do my surgery. And I think that uh, it's a reason to keep up at what uh, Liliana and Nick are doing in the laboratory because it really has, I think it will improve our outcomes in, in the future, if you, even if it's only a few percentage points. We're already low on our complication rates, but not having dropped bags and not having torn nuclei and stuff, I think is a worthwhile uh, topic. So, any questions, comments? Uh, yeah.
Oh, no question. I, and I think they, they, they improve our understanding of, you know, looking at these views, looking at the at technology. It, it, uh, it makes us better surgeons if we watch them. No, no question. So we should really thank Nick and Liliana for <laughs> what they do. That's what I Uh, any other questions? So, try the hurricane, everybody. At, uh, everybody at uh, my meeting is now. I got ten messages. They love the hurricane. Yes, sir. Just want to <coughs> offer one comment um, with respect to the PCRs. Yep. You mentioned that the service is really appreciated. Um, one thing I've been doing is on these cases where there's good establishment. No question. And if I think I need to stabilize it, I would do that. But if I, if I can get the nucleus out without without doing that using an, an MST hook, I'm much. It's just much easier for for me. So the visco dissection was also a study that we did here with Liliana and Basabadas, and it's uh, I should have shown that stuff too. The nice thing about it, it stays. It's it actually stays there. And I, I you saw that I do visco dissect every every pseudo exfoliation. Um, for that very reason. In case you need to put it in, one, uh, it's, it's ready to go, and two, because I think it really does uh, <laughs> stabilize that posterior capsule. So that's, a, that's a worth doing. And I'm not sure it matters whether you use a cohesive or a uh, dispersive, but I tend to use a cohesive. It's a little bit it's better space creator in that sense. So. Craig? No, no, I think it's going to change when people, uh, you know, the, the issue right now, is, unfortunately, is that you, that you have a very expensive tool that you ha someone has to pay for, right? And who pays for it is premium lenses. So the justification for see people buying those now is really that. But I think in the long run, uh, I think we'll be using it on these tough cases. We've done some decentered uh, lenses where we did a Rexus. It was perfect. I mean, instead of putting in loops and stretching and bringing the, the rexus down, you know, you can do that. Um, I know that uh, that uh, uh, Burkhard Dix actually done cases where he's put in a Malugan ring, taken them over. Now that the, the uh, with his, I don't, I'm not sure. Where, uh, his is probably a Zeiss That's unit Optometica. or Optometica. So and he has the water bath. Yeah. So Correct. Yep. Yeah. So I think really w it's a technology that, that we'll, we'll be using on these tough cases. But right now, no, no, you know, they're just, it's, it's hard to uh, justify it if you only have one or two or three a month that you're you need it on. So I, I think that as soon as the more of them become available, that, that'll start coming out. And I think that's the reason for getting into it. It's the tough cases. We can all do a, an easy eye wall uh, lens uh, R R L E if we want, but it'll be great for the tough ones, I think. So. Thank you. All right. Good work.